Hello. Welcome to Sub Zero. Um, I, I didn't, it, it wasn't really a planned um, talk, so forgive the off the cuff slides that I wrote like a couple hours ago. Um, <clears throat> but I figured it was probably worth, uh, you know, talking about a bit of the stuff that I've been working on and a bit of the stuff that I'm like either going to be working on or I'm particularly excited to see that I know is being worked on um, uh, for next year. Um, it's a bit of a brain dump, so uh, apologies in advance for the, for the lack of structure and, uh, and general plainness, but hopefully the content will be interesting. So uh, there's three sections. Um, first one is, you know, the past, what I've, been, uh, what I've been working on, what I've been working with other people, what I've been keeping an eye on. Um, and particularly the stuff that's been taking my time for like the last, last 12 months or so. Um, some of this stuff, I guess, many of you will already know, um, like 2D weights. Uh, this is like a fairly substantial fundamental change uh, to how, uh, uh, how substrate works, particularly for, for parachains. Um, some of the other stuff maybe is going to be a little more interesting um, uh, that you won't already know. So 2D weights, yeah. Um, in case you're not familiar with what this is, um, weights are, uh, 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 weight is a means of, of, of um, specifying the level of, uh, the amount of resources that a particular function, generally block import or transaction import, is allowed to use. Um, usually it's, uh, well, in the past, weights were one-dimensional, just the scale of value, the amount of computation time we expect a particular operation to take. Um, these days, uh, we have two separate resources. Um, we have both the execution time, but we also have the amount of space inside the proof of, uh, proof of validity. Um, the, basically, the proof that the parachain submits to the relay chain uh, that, uh, that, that, that the relay chain can check and make sure that the collator is not telling fibs, is not uh, cheating the system. Um, now, the problem is that if you, uh, if you have a transaction, it may take not very much time, but it may end up having a huge uh, footprint inside of this uh, proof of validity, this, this, uh, this data chunk that has to go to the, uh, the validator. And this is... Um, uh, this can open up your parachain um, to DOS attacks. Worse, um, if this can be, if this happens as part of like um, a mandatory piece, a mandatory function for block import, like for example on initialize as part of the scheduler, or maybe as part of um, executing XCMs, incoming XCM, then you've got a big problem because it would mean that you're uh, you're doing something that, which you can't opt out of doing, which is going to make your block unimportable because the proof of validity is just too big. So this is like crucial for parachain security. The way we're doing it at the moment is we're basically fudging it. We've got some very, very conservative limits that restrict what XCM can do, um, that restrict the amount of XCMs that can be executed. Um, and uh, we're kind of just really uh, not usually not using scheduler too much in order to um, um, reduce the chance that um, a mandatorily scheduled operation um, can, uh, 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 would, would um, uh, bloat this proof of validity block too much. Actually, the newer scheduler does take into account um, uh, the 2D weights. And um, over time, while we move things over to this new two-dimensional weights um, data type, we'll have all of the um, uh, operations that can be scheduled, all the dispatchables actually reporting their weight correctly. But this is like a fairly, fairly big, hefty refactor. Um, it's probably going to be finished, I would hope, in the next month or two. Um, uh, but it is rolling along. Message queues are, um, are an update to um, XCMP, UMP, DMP effectively needed because of the 2D weights refactoring. Um, essentially, it's, it's functionality um, deficit that we, needed to, um, that we needed to move, but it's kind of nice the way it's architected now. There's a unified message queue that works for all of the potential origins that messages can come from. 
whether it's from another parachain, whether it's from the relay chain, whether it's from the, um, um, uh, the local parachain itself, um, whether it's maybe from the contract um, uh, environment. It's all, it's all unified, they go into the same queue, and it's got a nice kind of round robin thing going on, so you've got a bit of quality of service guarantees, um, and it's 2D weight compatible. Um, something that's been on the sort of boiling away, simmering away for, for a while now is XCM v3. Um, it's got a bunch of stuff in it that's, that, uh, that people are going to find useful. It enables a bunch of stuff, not least uh, bridges. So uh, super, um, super keen on getting XCM uh, v3 merged. We're on the kind of final, I don't know, four relatively minor bullet points uh, before we actually merge it. Uh, it has undergone uh, an audit, so we're re reasonably confident on that regard that we at least know it's know any issues that are coming. Um, but some of the other things, like for example, uh, message queues and 2D weights, um, kind of need to be done before we can unlock all of the XCM v3 functionality. One of the big things that has uh, happened recently was, um, as I would hope most people here are aware, is uh, Gov2 or OpenGov, as it's recently been termed, um, launched on Kusama. Um, and we're seeing some of the first um, referendums happening um, under this new uh, logic. Uh, OpenGov is, is pretty cool. I don't know how much, um, how much you sort of looked into it. Um, basically, it, it, it's, it's um, a several abstractions that allow you to build um, democratic bodies, um, which can be composed in order um, to create these kind of sophisticated governance structures, um, but similarly very agile. The agility comes from the fact that you can have, um, you can have, you can effectively introduce many different origins. Um, so many, like I mean, origin in the technical term, the, you know, dispatchable uh, origins, um, each of which can have different effective privileges. And with each of these different origins, you can attach a different. Um, uh, sort of democratic or governance governance requirement that that, that uh, for, for for calls from these origins to be made. So obviously there's a the root origin which would have the most stringent requirements. But then you can have like the tip origin, right, which doesn't need to have very strong requirements at all. Why? Well, because the downside, the possible worst case that you can do um, if you can somehow manufacture access from this origin. Uh, is spend a very small amount of the treasury's funds, right? So this allows you to create really quite sophisticated governance models. Um, and I, t I found a new term a few days ago, like optimistic, uh, optimistic voting. It's basically like um, you kind of allow one particular party to have uh, to be able to dictate how a vote will go. Basically, they 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 will be able to um, push forward a vote unless other parties uh, actually say no. And this allows you to um, uh, vote on the thing. Well, it allows you to sort of fight out the things that are controversial, but get the things that aren't controversial through relatively quickly. As you might be aware at the moment, we have 28 days per referendum and only one referendum at once, excepting fast tracking um, on Polkadot. And it, it makes things very difficult to get through. And because everything has to get through on this same pipeline, um, it, a lot of things basically fall by the wayside. Well, that's no more with, with OpenGov. Uh, one of the things that um, uh, one of the things that we sort of aiming to do with OpenGov is allow free delegation because OpenGov removes um, some of these bodies like the technical committee and the uh, the council. One of the things that we want to do is introduce free delegation. Delegation is effectively this way of like uh, uh, having kind of representatives, so you don't have to like vote yourself necessarily. Um, but we want to get as many people delegating as possible, and this is hard uh, if it costs money, because most people you know, don't want to pay money in order to, to just have a voice. Um, most people are not, it turns out, all that bothered about having a voice in uh, these referendums. But the assumption is that if it's free and easy, maybe, uh, maybe we get a lot more people um, on board. One of the things that was introduced as part of OpenGov is the fellowship palette, which I I suspect uh, probably a few of you are aware of at least. Um, in some sense, this fulfills uh, one of the usage roles of the technical committee. Um, 
but it's a lot more pluralistic. And it turns out it's a lot more agile as well. And the way that it's been, uh, uh, the way that it's been written is to allow it to be reused through all sorts of other um, uh, uh, groups that we may want to have on-chain formations of. Um, the fellowship palette itself is for uh, experts on Polkadot's core technology. Um, there's a fairly substantial um, uh, white paper uh, that sort of explains um, uh, the social elements of this uh, on-chain um, structure. Um, one of the sort of key things to understand about it is it's a membership-oriented um, thing, so you know it's it's an on-chain collective that has a bunch of members, but each of these members has a rank, yeah. And the rank goes from basically one to nine, and there are rules, socially enforced rules. Some of them, at least, some can be on-chain enforced, uh, but the more the more rich ones are socially enforced, and these are the rules for promo getting promoted up through the ranks. Um, it's loosely based on martial arts uh, uh, ranking systems, and um, one of, the ways, one of the ways that it's useful, there's a few ways that it's useful. Uh, one of them is to provide recognition for um, those experts in the Polkadot protocol. Um, and in doing so, help safeguard Polkadot's, you know, the, the, the body that, 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 well, that contains Polkadot's expertise. Um, another one is to serve as the technical oracle for governance, right? So it's actually a governance body, can be used in that way. And another one is to provide incentivization for actually bothering to um, become a Polkadot expert and to retain that expertise. Um, and there are benefits accordingly for being within the body. And the hope is that eventually companies like um, uh, that employ individuals who have core uh, expertise on Polkadot and try and incentivize them to carry on doing that work won't strictly be needed because the chain will be able to build that incentivization structure itself. Um, now then. Uh, one of the mo most recent things that has finished um, is actually all green, it's ready to merge, hurrah, is the uh, NIS palette. Uh, NIS stands for non-interactive staking. It's not, it's a, let's say, a different form of staking very different to staking. But staking seems to be used for a lot of different things these days, so I decided to introduce a new meaning of the word. Um, this is um, essentially a, uh, it offers holders of a, uh, of a token, uh, particularly if the token uh, is uh, subject to inflation, to, to it, its, its monetary-based inflation. It offers the possibility of gaining a, a resistance to that inflation. Now you might say, well, hold on, we already have staking. That, that offers resistance to inflation as well. Actually, it offers staking is a little different. Staking is more of a quid pro quo. You, know, you offer to help Polkadot main it, maintain itself securely, and you get beyond inflation reward, right? So um, let's say 50% of the dot uh, token base is held in inflation. Well. Uh, if the overall, sorry, is held in staking, if the overall inflation rate is like, I don't know, 10%, then in principle, you're going to get up to 20% uh, rewards, right? But 10% after, after taking into account inflation. Well, this offers basically 0% after being taken into account inflation, but the nice thing is, huh, you don't have to do anything. Um, the way it's, it, 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 the underlying way that it works, you get a receipt, so you put, you put sort of stake using NIS, some tokens, you get a receipt back, right, that says your tokens constituted 0.01% of the network when you put them in. You can take this receipt back, this receipt's an NFT, right? You can transfer it around and you can take it back to the NIS system at, so after some point in time. Um, the deal is that you can't do it until some point in time, but after some point in time, you can take it back and you can get your original, uh, well, you can get an amount of tokens back such that the percentage of total issuance is the same, right? Now, the interesting thing is that in addition to the NFT, there's also a counterpart receipt, which is fungible. 
and it's based upon an, a particular upper level, upper amount of tokens, some amount of tokens that represents 100% of the network, 100% of market cap, right? So you're, you get your 0.01% NFT, but you would also get 0.01% of fungible tokens as well, yeah? And the idea is that you have to provide them both to get the original, uh, to trade them back in for the original uh, percent, percentage corrected um, uh, uh, tokens. These counterpart tokens can in principle just be moved around arbitrarily. They're fungible with each other. This gives, uh, this opens up a new asset. It opens up an asset which, when combined with an appropriate receipt, can be tradable for a percentage um, of the overall uh, market cap of a particular uh, token. Um, more on this later. So second section, um, some of the stuff that's already been um, completed but needs reforming, refactoring, and this is some of the, again, some of the stuff I'm excited about or I'm uh, working on. Polkadot Academy started last year in um, Cambridge, um, Cambridge, UK, not uh, the one in Massachusetts. Um, I did a bit of teaching there. Uh, we got through, I think, a little over 50, um, 50 students, um, and we taught them uh, boot, basically boot camp in uh, everything decentralized, crypto economic, Polkadot, Substrate, um, even finishing with XCM. Um, general outcome was, uh, was very good. Um, a lot of people were very happy. Anyone here who went to that, by the way? Uh, quite a few. Very good. Five, six, seven. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, this, this, this is looking, uh, looking like it is going the way that it was originally envisioned. And as such, we're going to start a new, uh, uh, um, a new intake um, early next year, January the 8th, if my memory serves, uh, in Buenos Aires this time, um, south of the border. Um, and the idea is that we'll probably have minimum 75, but probably closer to 100 students. And uh, yeah, I'll be helping out again. I'll be teaching a bit of crypto and, and stuff. Um, one of the other things that I think is, uh, this is more like refactoring, I suppose. Um, ecosystem standardization. There's a few ways that, that, to go in this, um, and I, but I think it, it sort of needs, and I, I've highlighted three here. There are for sure more, but these are the three that I think are relatively easy to do. Um, XCM configuration um, is a bit of a pain, I think, for, for, for many parachains. Uh, it's quite complex. Um, it reflects the early stage and the rather changing um, uh, 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 sort of an environment in which XCM sits. Um, but I think, it's, I think we can reasonably offer a fairly standardized XCM template configuration that can be tweaked perhaps for each chain, but in principle um, can reduce a lot of the uh, uh, tedium and risk um, from, uh, uh, from parachains. Um, XCM weights, at the moment it's a bit of a pain when you're sending a message to another chain to like try and calculate what the weight, uh, what weight should be provided and therefore what fees should be given and paid. Um, I think it's not unreasonable to have some fairly standardized weights so that uh, this basically isn't a problem. We, we just take reasonable case, reasonable to worst case kind of um, expectations, round it up and it's like, Weigh, weigh it yourself, but as long as your weights don't come in beyond the standardized weights, you're basically safe just to have standardized weights. You can put a little banner up. This parachain uses standardized weights, and all of the other parachains that want to send messages know that they can just work out what the standardized weight is for this message to be executed, and they don't have to bother about trying to figure out what your particular parachain's weight actually is. Um, and transaction priority, I've seen in the past, we actually had um, multiple... Um, uh, uh, what they call like tran extension, transaction extensions that are like trying to work out what the units for transaction priority are. We haven't really set any. Um, 
and I think it may be time to like uh, consider this. It's especially useful for things um, that, that are wrapping um, exotic kinds of transactions, um, uh, like some of the EVM-based uh, chains. And uh, at that point, I think it, it, yeah, this kind of thing is useful. There are. I don't want to uh, um, try and uh, suggest that I'm like all of the other levels of ecosystem standardizations are not. Uh, are not as important as these. These are just the ones that I think can be done in, in a matter of weeks rather than um, months and months. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the things that constantly um, comes up is weights and how difficult weights are, how tedious they are. I know, uh, particularly benchmarking, like weights themselves, don't, you know, whatever, but like benchmarking, very tedious, kind of error prone. Um, I've written uh, quite a few benchmarks myself. I'm well, well aware of this. Um, now, benchmarks are basically strictly necessary um, if you want to have the best, perform the best possible efficiency. But a lot of the time, the best possible efficiency isn't actually that important. You just want to get something that works, and you're willing to put it with like 80 or 90% efficiency. Um, one of the things that I think uh, will really try and push out through 2023 is this concept of weight clawback, which is basically saying, I'll give you an overestimate for how much weight this operation is going to take. Like, it won't take any more than whatever, x. But in reality, it's probably going to take x minus y, right? And y could be fairly substantial. Um, the crucial thing is, after the operation is completed, that we can check how much weight did it actually take and update our bookkeeping accordingly. Yeah? If we can do that, then suddenly Y can be really quite large. And the only thing we're really missing is the ability to squeeze in that last transactions into that last little bit of block space. Um, we could, for example, say, well, we don't know exactly how much weight this particular operation takes, but we know it's definitely no more than 10% of the block space. Yeah? Now, this means that even if you've got a block composed entirely of this particular transaction, you'll still be able to get 90% of the block full before eventually you get like a little over 90 and you suddenly think, well, ooh, I can't take the risk that it would actually take 10%. Um, this is probably going to be the strategy for trying to reduce the need um, for teams to uh, write these uh, fairly, you know, sophisticated benchmarking code. Um, of course, for operations that actually can take upwards of 10% of the block space, depending on the state or, uh, or, the, uh, or the, the inputs to the, to the transaction, to the operation, then, yeah, that's a bit different, and you actually do have to bother writing the benchmark. But for everything else, especially like relatively small, trivial things that are strictly limited in how, um, how much uh, uh, weight they can actually use up, this should be pretty, fi pretty much fine for, um, uh, for, for a lot of teams. Um, the relay chain was never meant to uh, enclose so much uh, functionality. Yeah? It was it's really there just to secure it. In fact, calling it a relay chain, it always niggled me a bit. In reality, it should be the security chain, because it's, at least when XCMP is properly finished, um, it won't really relay anything. Um, all it will really be doing is making sure that parachains are running securely. In any case, it's only meant to be it's, it's only meant to be validating. It's not meant to be like hosting tokens. It's not meant to be hosting the staking code. It's not meant to be hosting votes. It's not maybe hosting a name registration system. Um, these are all things that fit perfectly well into parachains, yeah? that can actually do real computation, but in, in, in a parallelized way. So we need to start offloading some of this functionality that has ended up on the relay chain, just because we didn't have anywhere else to roll it out to, um, and offload it into parachains. And that's something that, you know, I'll be focusing on, I think it's pretty exciting uh, to think about um, for next year. So we've already started this, you know, we've got statement. So there, are, there is assets functionality already on a parachain and as a system chain. Um, 
But, you know, bridges, uh, that was something that we could have rolled out sooner and rolled it out directly to the relay chain, but instead we held off a bit in order to actually get it into the parachain from the get-go because moving it would be an absolute pain. Um, there is already a collectives um, system chain, I think, um, and governance will slowly be being migrated onto there as well as some of the fellowships. Um, staking is, is an interesting one, but um, already starting to think about what's necessary to, for that to happen. And, you know, um, a, a, um, one of the chains that we haven't sort of talked about so much, at the moment the relay chain is hosting name registration, which is effectively a form of authenticity and certification. It would be nice to abstract that out a little bit and have it on its own chain. All right. So that's sort of the stuff that has largely been started or is being finished up. Now some of the stuff that's like legitimately sort of new. Um, the state tree, uh, Polkadot's state tree, was in some sense designed around the Ethereum um, state tree. Right? Both are Merkle trees. Uh, if you look at how it's implemented, they kind of have a fairly similar design. There was a lot of tweaks. We switched, for example, uh, the serialization format. We removed one of the types of tree nodes. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, the underlying implementation are, are fairly similar. Um, crucially, what is persisted on the... Uh, on the underlying disk is a Merkleized structure, right? It's actual cri crypto nodes, right? It's it's like no, it's it's chunks of data that m that form a Merkle tree. Yeah, it's not the keys and values themselves. So when you store and substrate something in a in a map, in a storage map in your palette, or you I don't know, put some. Uh, store some, I don't know, bit of data somewhere in a, in a, in a key. Um, this value directly doesn't correspond to any particular key or value in the database. In reality, it corresponds to kind of a number of different keys and values that make up the root, uh, the root with a U, R-O-U-T-E, from the root without a U down to the leaf. Um, this is fine, it's general, right? It works. You can implement what you want to implement, yeah? If you want a value that only stays around for the period of the block, like for example, we, we record the block number, yeah? This is a value that we only, it's, in, it's actually held in storage, but it gets deleted at the end of the block and it gets put in at the beginning of the block. Some of the header data is the same, right? It gets put in at the beginning of the block, it gets deleted at the end of the block. You can, you can implement it using this. You just make sure it gets deleted, right? Sorted. Um, but it's not as fast as it could be, because when you try and read it, it has to do something clever, like go and check in its disk-backed bit whether there's something there already. Um, there are other things, like event, events are a bit of a pain. They take up a single storage item that just gets appended to. And at the moment, there's no way to tell Substrate that they never get read from, which means in principle, you've got this kind of huge store, potentially huge unbounded storage item that might make its way into the proof of validity of a parachain and therefore make the proof of validity really, really big. Um, and if someone accidentally did write code that read it, it would be a big problem. Um, furthermore, there are certain like queries and processing that you might want to do on events that essentially now are unbounded. Um, they're not in an effective, in a useful format for this. And it doesn't really let you do interesting stuff, like, for example, um, as part of uh, block uh, processing, um, create ways of, of um, indexing certain events. So you might have an event like, I don't know, balance transfer, and you just want to know, um, uh, you want an index so you can easily prove this account did or did not make a balance transfer in this block. Well, you can't really do that at the moment. You just have to list all of the events that happened and then go through them all and show that none of them 
implied a balance transfer from this account to that account. That's not very efficient, particularly for light clients. And some of the stuff that we want to do in the future that would be um, massive optimized, potentially, optimizations for Substrate, for Parachains, for Polkadot, um, you just can't do with these ki this kind of data structure. Um, you need kind of, uh, you need a, a lot more flexibility. You need the possibility of having um, an entirely um, arbitrary, basically, data structure given a key value, given a map of key value pairs. I'm not going to go too much into this at this stage because it would take a really long time, but suffice it to say, what we're going to do, what we're going to try and do, there's already an issue, um, is implement some uh, new host functions that allow for all of these things to happen super efficiently. Um, statement holding hub protocol or SS SHH protocol. Um, accounts. Uh, this is this is similar to Whisper. Um, you know, I don't know whenever that was seven years ago, eight years ago, long time ago. Um, it's similar to Whisper. The only difference is that whereas Whisper didn't really have an answer to uh, any kind of denial of service attack, um, this kind of does because it's only accounts that are holding funds that are able to actually send post messages to this uh, massive global DHT. That's essentially what this is, a massive global DHT. But the idea being that off-chain workers can kind of subscribe to um, pigeonholes in this massive global DHT and be told when something new has been posted by an account. The nice thing is that posting um, a datagram to this massive global DHT um, doesn't cost anything, right? Because you're not touching the chain. So this means that you can have, it opens up the possibility of having, for example, free delegation. Because these things can be signed statements, you can basically say, I will sign, um, I, you know, I reckon um, Raul Romanuti is a great, a great voter and he knows exactly what's going on with Polkadot all the time. Therefore, I'm going to delegate some of my, uh, my, my, my accounts, the funds in my accounts, to vote for him. But here's the thing, I don't want to pay anything, yeah? I'm just going to delegate. I'm just going to say, I'm, 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 I'm giving him permission to claim this delegation. It's just a statement. It's signed, but it doesn't equate to any kind of uh, transaction, yeah? No, no funds are ever going to go out of my account because I've signed this statement. But what it does is it means that Raul can come along and say, ooh, someone has delegated um, uh, their, uh, their, their voting power to me. And Raul can go and pay the funds, include this signed statement on chain, and then the chain will then run the delegation and he will be delegated. I never had to pay any money, but uh, only, only Raul does it. It's an opt-in for Raul. If he says, well, this guy hasn't got enough dot to make it worth my while, then he will just ignore the statement. So this is the sort of thing that opens up, but there's like a whole host of other stuff, I am sure, uh, that you might be able to think of as well. Um, one of the things that's, uh, you know, been uh, talked about for a long time Parathreads. Um, this has now uh, become a more abstract form of itself, exotic core scheduling, exotic para core scheduling, basically opening up new scheduling mechanisms for, um, for these para, para chain cores. At the moment, we've only got like, these two-year leases. This is like, um, yeah, a fairly uh, difficult, a fairly, I don't know what you call it, uh, abstruse way of, 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 of working out what computation should be checked by the relay chain. Um, so we want to open, open up and like create a much more, um, a much wider spectrum of uh, ways of utilizing Polkadot's block space. This is what it comes down to, right? This is an, uh, the, the new way of thinking. Polkadot has a bunch of high quality block space, um, probably the highest quality uh, the, most of the highest quality block space out, out there, right? It's got a huge amount of high quality block space. Um, and the question is, how do we parcel it up and, and sell it off and make sure that the DOT token benefits, like there is a useful economy around this block space? 
And as it, as it stands, the PLOs are, and, and with the crowd loans are like just the one first step. And there needs to be many more steps. And one of the ways to unlock these many more steps are uh, exotic core scheduling. So this is something that we're like, um, is being worked on, something that I'm very excited to see. Para threads, which is basically pay as you go, block by block. Um, scheduling would be one of the ways. There are several other um, scheduling, economic scheduling mechanisms that we can think of. Um, round robin uh, being, uh, so basically N para chains can share the same, um, same kind of lease. But we can also think of like short term, but not really short term leases. Like, I don't know, two week leases, one week leases. Yeah? And you just pay, kind of pay as you go, somewhere between power threads and power chains. Anyway. Um, one of the, you know, we already saw the fellowship launched uh, last week. Maybe it was the week before, last couple of weeks. Um, it's only meant to be the first of its kind. There are several others that I want to uh, launch. Um, probably the first one to launch, the, first, the next one to launch, uh, will be the uh, Ecosystem Technical Fellowship. So all the people that are, uh, you know, building with Polkadot that have, you know, uh, not knowledge of the core, maybe knowledge of the core, core protocol too, but not just knowledge of the core protocol, but knowledge of how to use Polkadot, how to build on Polkadot, uh, knowledge of the peripheral tools and services. Um, how to build a parachain, how to deploy a parachain, all of this stuff. Um, it will have similar sort of uh, uh, mid-level goals as the, as the first fellowship. Um, recognition of, of expertise being you know, one of the crucial ones. Um, but potentially also an eventual role in governance. And one of the things that I can immediately think of, you know, parachains often, not often, thankfully, but sometimes uh, come to the uh, come to the technical committee say oh you know we've bricked it it happened it happens um, you know can you can you switch things over can can we get a fast tracked referendum now this will be partially fixed in gov2 anyway uh, simply because of the fact it will be a different origin that is required one that doesn't have one that can be executed much more optimistically but even ignoring that Hey, it could be that uh, the Ecosystem Tech Fellowship itself is a democratic body that, ha that, that can vote in order to essentially unbrick a parachain, rescue it, move it back to a previous state, whatever. Um, this, is, uh, this is, in my mind, how a lot of this stuff should be solved, basically by moving things closer to um, uh, you know, a, a body that, that, that could reasonably be... Um, uh, considered expert enough, but also uh, decentralized and, 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 and diverse enough to, um, to make sure stuff doesn't just get uh, uh, broken more. Okay, uh, I think that's it, yeah. Final thing, Polkadot Payroll. Um, this is another one of these governance structures. I mean, when I say governance, I get the impression I'm talking about what a lot of people mean when they say DAO. Um, but whatever, I'm going to stick with my original terminology. Um, but this is another governance structure. Think of this as like the Polkadot Civil Service. Um, essentially a broad, uh, uh, broad on-ramp, right? A way of um, trying to recognize valuable contributions, like when someone is doing consistent valuable contributions and ensure that they have a consistent income from it. In some sense, it, it, it's here to try to mitigate um, or even, um, you know, really reduce um, the, um, the level uh, of uh, uh, need that Polkadot has on some of the uh, bigger um, uh, organizations in the space, not least Parity and the Foundation. Um, the idea is to make it really very much an on-ramp, permissionless entry, um, minimal requirements check, basically just, you know, are, are you a reasonable bet, yeah? Are you reasonably likely to actually do anything in two weeks? Um, think something like, 
I don't know, a CV, yeah. Um, you've been to a course, like, I don't know, the, the Polkadot Academy, right? Um, you've already done some pull requests. I don't know, something, something very basic that is easily checkable and just make sure, yeah, you, you, you may well actually do, some, do something useful for Polkadot. And you get a proving period, a couple of weeks, right, to actually do something. Uh, if you do something, it, checked by probably the fellowship, maybe the, uh, the ecosystem tech fellowship for technical individuals, right? If that comes through and, and, and they say, yeah, you've been doing a fairly decent amount of work, eventually, maybe let's say after five work periods, you, you basically make your way into the payroll and you become a, a payrolled um, uh, account. And the idea is that this, this can be the on-ramp into fellowships, not necessarily just the fellowship, the first one, but also other fellowships. An ambassadorial fellowship, for example, ecosystem tech fellowship. Um, this is, uh, there's a, a much um, more detailed design document that's gathering dust, uh, but this will be, as I say, something to um, look out for in 2023. Good. Um, that's all I have to say for now. I hope it was uh, a bit enlightening at least. Um, thanks and do enjoy Sub-Zero.